now. So, okay. Perfect. Okay. It says we're live on Facebook. A happy Aloha Friday here from Hawaii. And my special guest today for Philbro Fridays is Dr. Melissa Palma. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you, Annalisa. Happy Phil Pro Friday to you too. Yes, and, and you know, and I, as I tell everyone that comes on this with me, it's really a chance to check up on everyone. Obviously, since it's our 10 year anniversary of the organization, such a milestone. And you know, it's been a while since people really got together, especially with COVID. And you were on the front lines, obviously, with all of this pandemic. But before we get to that, I wanted to, you know, update our people, our network on what you've been up to since you did the immersion program? Yeah, for sure. So um, for those of you who um, don't know me, hi, my name is Melissa or Issa Palma. Um, I'm actually a preventive medicine and family medicine um, trainee at uh, Cook County Health in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm originally from Iowa. Uh, my mom is from Pampanga and my dad is from Kitsum City. Uh, and I did PillPro in 2018. So the one of the last couple years, it was an in-person immersion program. And I will be one of the first people to say that PillPro absolutely changed my life, um, definitely for the better. Uh, you know, prior to joining PillPro, I had been really involved with a lot of, you know, student-run free medical clinics with uh, migrant farm workers in Iowa. Um, I had done a lot about just learning about, you know, global health, international health, and health disparities, but it wasn't until I joined PhilPro that I felt like I could actually do something for the Filipino community um, in such a meaningful way. Um, and so, um, as we'll probably talk about a lot during um, during this um, PhilPro Friday chat, you know, I work a lot now with uh, many Pinoy medical students through the Council of Young Filipinx Americans in Medicine. Um, we do a lot of COVID-19 education and outreach for our Kababayan with tayohelp.com and the PhilPro COVID-19 Task Force. Um, and so I, I guess you can say since, um, you know, since the immersion program, since 2018, we've all been on a whirlwind adventure. Um, but I'm glad that I've been able to partner with so many great, um, you know, inspired community organizers um, and servants here within the Philpro community, um, just to learn more about ourselves and also just to, you know, educate the community. Yeah, it's it's like you never really left though, right? <laughs> I feel like you, ever since you um, got involved, you've been full steam ahead, really a leader in our organization. And that's, so that's amazing. Um, and working on this, you know, this Tayo initiative, uh, that's really been groundbreaking for us. Um, but first let's talk about your experience with the pandemic. Obviously as a doctor, you're part of the many, many, you know, medical professionals uh, in our Filipino community that were really hit with this. Uh, tell us about how that has, you know, that went, how that, you know, was for you, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, I had a unique perspective as well, because not only am I, you know, a frontline primary care clinician, um, I also work um, at times in the hospital um, during various waves, waves of the COVID pandemic. Um, I also am part of a preventive medicine and public health program. So within the Cook County Department of Public Health, you know, our health department was one of the first to actually get deployed to some of the earliest cases of COVID-19 in the United States. And actually the first person-to-person -person transmission of COVID happened in um, the suburb, sub suburban Cook County. Um, and many of my colleagues were actually kind of on the front lines even there trying to do contact tracing within this community hospital system that really didn't necessarily have all the resources as a you know, as a large academic center. And so it was really interesting to see like both the public health response on one side and then also kind of the clinical response on the other side, knowing that um, there are many Filipinos in Kababayan who work on both sides of that as well, both in the Philippines and in the United States. Um, and I think, you know, the first, the first waves that were happening in like early March, April, as soon as lockdown happened, you know, these were things we were paying attention to in the public health world for many months before, you know, I'd be reading um, articles online or I'd be seeing like med Twitter and seeing everything that was coming out of China. But it wasn't until I think like the third week of March 2020, in which I actually was, you know, taking the train from my apartment to the hospital, I get, like change over downtown and I'm looking at like the Dunkin Donuts by um, like City Hall. And there's people social distancing spacing. And that was the first time I had seen it in the United States. And it's like, wait, 
okay, something different is happening. And then, you know, those next few weeks of in the hospital, you know, our COVID wards are filling up. I think at one point in time, we had six full floors of COVID wars um, and having to get, you know, people who would say that they would staff them, even though we didn't necessarily know, you know, what were the best treatment options, like being having to have to ration PPE, having to have to um, do a lot of things with great uncertainty. Um, but it was really, you know, heartening to see how a lot of our community members kind of stepped up um, during that time. And we def but we definitely know that, you know, Filipino nurses and healthcare workers have taken, you know, a big toll during the pandemic as well. And so I think, you know, during everything that was going on, whether it be initial, you know, lockdowns, initial vaccine rollouts, now vaccine misinformation, kind of this whole roller coaster ride of what's been going on during the pandemic and even now as we're entering into like this more endemic stage of everything that's happening, you know, I really do think that the work that we've been doing with Tayo and the work that we've been doing with the Phil Pro COVID Task Force has been really gratifying in a way that sometimes the clinical work can feel so disheartening because you just see patients who, you know, aren't unable to access treatment or unable to access vaccines have really poor outcomes, you know, in these hospitalized COVID patients. Um, but then you also get to work on the other side in prevention and in the public health side and really working on, you know, trying to make, keep all of us safe and healthy before they even get to the point where they have to see me in the hospital. Um, so I've been really grateful to have that kind of dual experience, um, both as a, you know, frontline clinician, but also working on the community level in education and outreach. Yeah, I think it really underscores how important information is, especially for our community that, you know, also has issues of access, like you mentioned, equity, um, language issues, barriers. And, um, and that's something I know that the initiative really, you know, takes on. Um, so I guess from your work, obviously, so entrenched in all of the, you know, what, what was happening on the front lines, how did that kind of motivate you to be part of and start the Tayo with with our group here at Phil Pro. Like how did how did that yeah you, that, you know because you obviously saw the disparity in in inequity. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think you know it's kind of become in the the Tayo help origin story um, as some of us like to call it because mm -hmm. you know many of us who were on Phil Pro's leadership at the time, you know, we would have Zoom meetings um, just to talk about, you know, the business of keeping Philpro as a nonprofit, um, you know, to complete its charitable work. And at some point in time in April of 2020, you know, one of our members, Dari Rojo, had essentially told us that he was having this really hard time speaking with his own father. You know, here we are, you know, you know, second gen kids, professional children of immigrants who can kind of function in both worlds, you know, we can read CDC updates. We, you know, have all of these protocols coming out in our professional lives that maybe our parents or our lolos or our lolas aren't getting access to in every single facet of their, uh, of maybe their social lives on Facebook or something like that. And so during this time in April of 2020, Donnie was telling us how he was having to really fight and yell with his father not to travel to the Philippines in April of 2020. And the, to the fact of that point that we, ourselves as individuals, we're having such a hard time, even, you know, backed with all of the facts and information. And, you know, those of us who are, you know, even in the medical profession, we're having a hard time to visit family members, you know, don't travel, it's not safe, all of these different things. And so, you know, after hearing that experience and kind of reflecting amongst ourselves, all of us really wanted to say, you know, like, how do we make trustworthy information go viral with, with our families? You know, how do we make it, you know, not just a meme about which which type of like imasal is best, but actually how do we keep ourselves safe and healthy? And so I think, you know, we had originally thought of the tayohelp.com and Tayo Help Desk as a playbook, um, a way for our community members to be able to access information that's um, relevant to their lives um, and in a way that they can understand, whether it be translated into Filipino, Tagalog or other languages, or just showing with messaging to say like, this is for us, you know, we, um, Filipinos living in the United States, um, you know, we're members of the community and, you know, this is how we communicate with each other, sometimes as chaotic as it may be, you know, this is how we're going to talk to each other and this is how we're going to care for each other. And I think, you know, it was like that kernel, that real seed of wanting to be able to take care of all of us in a time where it was really hard to know who, who to trust um, and, you know, what to trust. And so I think 
a lot of that comes from, you know, the, the conversations we've had with our families and even amongst ourselves. Yeah, it, difficult conversations. I know a lot of um, Filipinos, uh, old school style, just rely on, you know, social media, <laughs> you know, their friends um, sharing tips with vitamins and things like that. I mean, at least the the ones that I've spoken to that have, for example, just distrusted, um, you know, the vaccine and all of that. I mean, are we still, are you still seeing that? Are we still seeing that even with that, with all the resources out there, with all of the information and evidence, are, are we still seeing a lot of that kind of distrust? Yeah, I think, you know, overall in the general population within the United States, somewhere between 70 and 75% of Americans have been vaccinated at this point and only about 30%, 30 to 40% have been boosted. Um, so there's still a lot of messaging that needs to happen and a, lo- a lot of conversations that we can have with our families just about, you know, safety and efficacy of vaccines. And I think, you know, a lot of that comes from a, you know, a place where, you know, in the Philippines, maybe not too long ago, even just in 2018, 2019, there was kind of a vaccine scandal when the WHO and the Philippine Department of Public Health rolled out a dengue fever, dengue baksha vaccination um, that actually just due to um, lack of a, sing- a single step of testing whether or not children had had the dengue fever in the past um, caused some adverse reactions because it was implemented in a way um, that didn't make that have that crucial screening step. And as a result of that, you know, um, vaccination rates for all vaccines in the Philippines itself dropped by about 30%. Um, And that's kind of like the backdrop of what was happening in the Philippines even before COVID-19 came out. Um, Because a lot of the research that was being done at the time showed that, you know, in early like 2020, late 2020, you know, lots of different countries in Asia were really, um, were really, um, would be receptive to vaccinations, um, including the Philippines. Um, but I think that it's important that when we talk to our community members and our families about vaccination, you know, we're able to answer their questions about things that have happened in the Philippines that maybe are more top of mind to them um, than other things that are happening here in the U.S. And another part of it is kind of getting a pulse on, uh, you know, how our community is doing with response and uh, vaccine acceptance. And I know there was some talk about doing data collection and a report on this. Can you give us an Mm -hmm. update on how that's going? Yeah, for sure. Um, So I think, you know, one of the things that has really limited our ability as a community to respond to people's needs, you know, Collecting oral histories is one form of data collection, right? As a journalist, you're collecting stories, it's generating data, it's sharing the stories of what's happening to people on the ground. Um, but a lot of times that really nitty gritty, like quantitative epidemiological data is not really accessible or even available to folks. I know, you know, at least in Hawaii and California and parts of New York City, you know, Asian Americans are disaggregated, but you can actually see Um, how Filipinos are different from, say, um, like Native Hawaiians, or how Filipinos are different from South Asians. And so you can really see the differences in how messaging and hesitancy and, um, you know, how patterns of migration are really affecting different communities. Um, But for most Filipinos in most parts of the U.S., that's really not accessible or available. Um, And so part of the Tayo Help Desk is uh, one of the things, in addition to kind of being a one-stop shop Q&A help desk for folks to learn about a lot of COVID-19 information, is that we actually do want to start um, having surveys and scientific studies to really gauge kind of what's the pulse of the community um, throughout all of this. And so we've been working with a lot of our students with the Council of Young Philippines Americans in Medicine, um, several other Pinoy researchers, as well to try and um, formulate a questionnaire, a survey um, that we're hoping to launch very soon um, to try and answer those questions for ourselves, right? Because um, with, you know, there have been reports that, you know, Filipinos and Vietnamese Americans were less likely um, to want to receive a vaccine than other Asian American subgroups. And the question is, you know, is that due to, you know, histories uh, like ties with government, like distrust of government? Is that due to religious factors? Um, you know, there have been, you know, actually the Philippine Council of Catholic Bishops and the Pope himself came out in support of vaccination. So there's been a lot of um, kind of rumors and other things going on out there about like why someone should or shouldn't take a vaccine. Um, and I think it'll be um, really interesting for us and also really helpful um, for us to, you know, be able to address some of these fears for the community. 
Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And speaking to some people, it really was um, not just religion, but I guess the fact that they wanted to try a, a natural approach, right? Like, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, medicines and not medicines, mm -hmm. but vitamins and, mm -hmm. and herbs. And as a doctor, have you seen that type of kind of sentiment also mm -hmm. from patients or just the community? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there's always, there's always a push for things that are natural and for things that, you know, there's, you know, there's fear around sometimes science as well. And, and the big my, money around it. And the big use, money around it, right? Yeah. And, you know, my, my take on this is that, you know, COVID vaccinations coming out in a year is a medical miracle unlike one that we have ever seen kind of in like the history of vaccination, you know? And so, you know, when COVID-19 first came out, we were like hoping and praying that we would get a vaccine that was maybe only just 50% 50 50 effective. If it were even 50% effective, we would have given it out to the whole world just because of how um, dangerous, severe COVID-19 can be. Um, and so the fact that when the mRNA vaccines came out, Moderna and Pfizer, you know, we were getting like 95%, you know, 95, 95% um, efficacy against severe inf severe infections and death like that that is like a medical miracle we should all be excited about and so I think that like while you know vac while vaccines um, are a tool you know vitamins keeping a healthy um, he healthy weight keeping up with healthy exercise all of these things keeping rested making sure your mental health and check these are all added things that can help us stay healthy um, the truth the truth is is that you know the natural effect of COVID-19 is infection, right? So the most natural way to get, um, prevent COVID-19 infection this, uh, is for a lot of people in the United States has been through um, breakthrough infections, unfortunately. And the problem is that the risk of breakthrough infections um, may, means that you are, you know, much more likely to have severe COVID-19 or death. And that's the thing we really want to, you know, prevent is that people, especially those who are elders, especially those who have, you um, you know, diabetes or high blood pressure or other types of things that make them high risk. We really want to prevent those really, really serious, dangerous things like severe COVID and death. Um, and so we we've seen that you know even with schools being open and all these things, the number of the number of children dying from COVID nineteen is much higher than we really should you know want it to be. I think in the you know the teenager range, the number four cause of death at this point in time is COVID nineteen, kind of behind um, suicide, accidents, and drownings. And so, wow, I, I did not um, know that. Um, and so, you know, even though we want to protect our elders, we want to protect people who are at high risk. Um, a lot of us, you know, sometimes we don't even know that we're high risk until it's too late. Yeah, is it? Um, you know, a lot of people will say it's um, underlying conditions. Oh, they weren't healthy anyway. Um, you know, is there any truth to that, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to being more susceptible to getting it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, all of most of the studies out there show that, you know, it's, it's, it, they're crazy numbers that like anywhere 30 times, like 90 times more likely um, to die of COVID-19 if you're in the upper, you know, the over 85 age group, the over 65 age group, you know, adding on all these different risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and things like that. Um, but for you know the younger people, um, it's kind of even if just a small small percentage of people who get COVID nineteen overall end up having severe COVID or long COVID, it's what we call you know quality adjusted of life years lost. It's the young people who are actually going to have the longest period of time um, having the problems after someone gets a severe case of COVID. So it's the young people who actually have the most to lose um, and are probably more likely the ones to be a little more social maybe a little bit more lax with mask wearing, um, more likely to take some of those risks that, um, you know, different people at different points in their life might have a different uh, tolerance for. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think going forward, um, where, what should be, I guess, the focus, the priority as we're obviously with Tayo Help, um, mm -hmm. you have the hotline, the call center, mm -hmm. Um, where, where do we, where should we put our efforts going forward with this, uh, this disease? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because, you know, we've kind of had this shift in, I guess, messaging, right? At the first, first outset of the pandemic, it was just try, you know, wait your turn, right? 
let our elders have the vaccines first, you know, let people with high risk conditions have the vaccines first, um, let frontline workers have the vaccines first, and then kind of everyone else can wait in line. And now that messaging has a little bit shifted into um, just reminding people that they're still at risk, right? Um, and so, you know, with the Tayo Helpline, um, which we recently lost, launched um, was geared towards making vaccine information more accessible to elders who might not be as uh, savvy with like the phones and with the websites for tayohelp.com. Um, but I think a lot of what's happening now is instead of, you know, is going to be like that deep work of conversations with the people that you love, right? Because now the, you know, the uh, main goal is not just to, you know, it used to be um, stay home and stay safe, which is still definitely true if you have an exposure. It's still definitely true if there's lots of community transmission, um, but it's more along the lines of within your own family units or your own communities, like, okay, what do we need to do to keep each other safe and to keep everyone healthy that we care about? And so that's where you come into these conversations about, okay, this family are, is going to pod because, you know, Lola just got diagnosed with cancer and she's going to go through chemotherapy. And so now, you know, all the family members are going to mask, they're going to get their boosters, they're going to try and make up this like, like little cocoon of immunity around Lola because, you know, now she's sick um, versus maybe, you know, you're um, a person who, um, say, is a frontline worker and you don't really have a choice of how many people that you're coming in contact with every day. And so while you may choose to wear a mask, you know, your customers um, may not be doing those things. Um, and so you're being exposed to whatever risk, you know, you're willing to take by being at work, but you're also being inadvertently exposed to the risk of all these other people whose choices you don't really have control over. Um, and so I think it's really up to, you know, within our own communities to have our own community agreements about, you know, how are we going to protect those who are most at risk? And then also, um, you know, fighting for policies for people um, in public spaces, people who are frontline workers, people who um, don't have health insurance to be able to access the things that you need. Because like when you have access to health insurance, when you have access to, you know, a, a multi-generational home that can then socially distance because you have enough space, you know, choosing to do different types of pandemic precautions um, is a real privilege. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, it's not a choice. Um, and so I think, you know, that's the, the conversations that we're going to continue to have, um, you know, because as much as we hate to say it, you know, COVID's going to stay with us. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't know if you're seeing this in Chicago also, but here in Hawaii, the cases are are going higher. Um, and obviously people are fatigued. You know, they are just ready to live life. Um, a lot of the kids had had, you know, a really rough time with schools like my kids. And I think, um, yeah, it's just then you talk about the mental wellness of everyone and uh, just how many people went into depression. Um, we don't talk about it openly in, you know, the news, for example, about suicides, but it's it's you know, it happened. It's it's increased during this period. Right. And and now it's like while the the deaths physically from COVID, um, you know, from from the disease, disease itself haven't um, been as bad. Uh, we're still talking about these longer term effects, you know, to our communities. And I guess, you know, what have you been seeing over there? Is it the same kind of um, kind of feeling that how do we move beyond this um, and still stay vigilant? You know, because mm -hmm. there's people that just want to go back to their their lives. I mean, if you go in Waikiki, for example, you would think there's no COVID anymore because yeah. you know, people are just. Yeah live in their lives yeah, but yeah. Um, at the same time there's people that are saying oh my gosh you know it's it's still there and people are getting mm -hmm. infected mm -hmm. yeah i think definitely you know you know chicago we definitely have winters and so during the winter months like masking indoors is something that was seen as preferred especially as we went through the old mccann race um you know i think like most of the country um, we had a little bit of lull and dip um earlier in the first couple months but as the new you know, as new variants um, start becoming more prevalent, um, Illinois has actually moved from, um, you know, the CDC changed its um, guidelines for what's considered high, medium, and low risk on February 25th. Um, and so by those new guidelines, Illinois was in the green, but in the past couple of months, actually moved into the yellow zone where um, mask mandates are not back, you know, as a state, like a statewide policy, um, but the Chicago Department of Public Health has um, 
urge people to consider wearing masks indoors voluntarily without actually putting a formal mask mandate. Um, and so it's really hard, right? Because, you know, Chicago summers are when the entire city kind of goes outdoors and gets to enjoy the outdoors while it still lasts for us here. Um, and so for sure, there's a lot of um, places for people to gather and be together outside um, with a little bit better ventilation. Um, and so I definitely acknowledge that um, youth mental health, mental health overhaul has taken um, a real toll during COVID-19 um, and that, you know, being physically closer to each other and having events and having places to socialize definitely improves people's mental well-being for sure. But I just, I just caution everyone to be cautious when you can. Um, and mainly because um, we don't, we still like don't know the long-term effects of COVID, right? And so, you know, for people who have quote unquote long COVID, you know, this is a disease that's only been present for the past couple of years. Um, and so they kind of say that COVID-19 has become this mass disabling event. Um, and even prior to COVID, you know, um, being able to access um, accessibility um, for folks with different types of disabilities, um, whether it be physical, whether it be mental health, um, was never um, really prioritized. And so I think that, you know, all of these are just conversations that we're opening and that we're going to have kind of throughout the pandemic and throughout the aftermath of the pandemic um, to really help us figure out like what it is that people need to survive and thrive. Yeah, and obviously uh, it's it's good to see that uh, Filipino leaders like yourself in the community are, you know, leading the charge for education, prevention, um, especially with Tayo. So I'm very proud of your team, the whole team that has been behind this initiative and looking forward to a lot of the, you know, great work that you guys continue to do. Is there any kind of ask if you wanted to manifest kind of where we want to be in the next few years with not just Tayo, but Phil Pro and, you know, how we can, I guess, strengthen our organization and, and work toward the goals that we have for our, mm -hmm. for our Kababayan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I definitely, you know, hold this as my, as you know, a Filipino who grew up in Iowa with like a small, like a very small but close knit group of Pinoys um, who are in my mother's extended friend network, um, is that, you know, we have strength in numbers, right? Filipinos are over 4 million strong here in the United States, um, not just in places like California, New York, and Hawaii, you know, we're here in the Midwest, um, in many, in many places in the South. And so, because we have strength in numbers, um, you know, we encourage you to get involved, whether it be with Philpro because our membership is open to anyone, whether it be in your local, you know, college Pinoy group, whether that be in your church group, right? Um, we just call you to get involved um, because being able to care and give back to your community is one of the best ways um, in order to, to stay connected um, during these, um, you know, these trying COVID times. Um, and if, in any, you know, way, you know, help share all the resources that we've been um, kind of creating for all of you and for all of us. Um, so sharing tayohelp.com, um, sharing the, uh, the Tayo helpline here, I'll, I'll give you the number right now if I can pull it up. Um, so yeah, if you have a Lola, or if you have a Tita, or if you have someone who like really doesn't like looking stuff up online, but prefer to talk to an actual person, it's available in English and Tagalog or Filipino. So the number is 1-800-899-5090. That's the Phil Pro Tile Helpline. Um, and it's open from um, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I believe. So um, yeah, so that's right six to two here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for our Hawaii folks. Yeah. And I know that Phil Pro for sure is also it's a big year, not just, you know, us having our profiles of our, our Filipino leaders through this show, but also a road show. So I know that Lizelle is going around the, the country and Chicago. She's stopping by, right? The 23rd. Yeah, we're going to welcome uh, Lizelle to the Windy City next week. <laughs> um, she'll be speaking at a conference and then also be helping present um, some of our amazing community leaders here in Chicago at the Philpro Roadshow. So we're really excited um, to learn more about um, trailblazing Kenai's um, uh, leading the way in luminaries in their own field. Yeah, no, I well, hopefully I don't know if you guys are also doing an online version of that. 
is there is there like a hybrid or is it just all in person oh, we'll, have to, we'll, have, we'll have to ask we'll definitely have to ask her have someone we, do a, a live happen. have someone like uh, stan because um it would be nice to catch up on that and see how it is because uh for those of us who can't join in person um but oh my gosh isa thank you so much it is so good to catch up with you and so proud of the great work you guys are doing um and yeah and take care of yourself also you know don't forget i know you guys are working for the community so it's um it's part of that job to take care of ourselves and our mental health so <laughs> all, right. all right well thank you annalisa it's good to chat with you yay take care bye bye